this is hell. Dating back to the Nixon administration, the U.S. government was growing acutely aware that fossil fuel burning by humans would cause carbon dioxide to build up in the atmosphere and lead to catastrophic climate change. During the Carter administration, the government grew even more certain about impending climate change, that it was caused by us, and that something needed to be done and fast. Instead, nothing was done, and here we are living in climate change. Here to tell us how and why they knew, we are honored to have on our show James Gustav Speth, author of They Knew, the U.S. federal government's 50-year role in causing the climate crisis. Gus, welcome to This Is Hell, and thank you so much for being on our show. Well, thank you, Chuck, and I'm glad to be here. Look forward to the to the chat. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, read some longer quotes from your book because I think it's important for people to understand some of the background here. The introduction to your book, for instance, is co-written by Julia Olson, who founded Our Children's Trust (OCT) in 2010, and is that group's executive director and is also co-lead counsel in Juliana versus the United States, along with her co-author, Philip Gregory. Our Children's Trust states that it is a non-profit public interest law firm that provides strategic campaign-based legal services to youth from diverse backgrounds to secure their legal rights to a safe climate. Legal rights to a safe climate. Why should people have legal rights to a safe climate, Gus? Well, we certainly don't have legislative rights to it uh, that have been legislated uh, by our Congress. My story does recount this 50-year period uh, in which uh, the federal government uh, consistently and and repeatedly uh, promoted our dependence on fossil fuels and, and thus promoted the climate catastrophe that we are now beginning to experience. So... My view is uh, we need the courts uh, very badly uh, to step in, as they have in a number of uh, European countries and Australia, uh, to establish a framework to protect citizens. Because uh, honestly, um, uh, you know, we can't rely on uh, the other two branches of government to do it. So we need the courts. We need the courts backed up by a. Uh, a huge uh, citizen mobilization, and um, and those two together, uh, you know, to me, point to the answer. Now we can talk about later, uh, Chuck, at any length you you would like the what what uh, President Biden has has been up to on climate and and where that stands and whether that changes uh, the picture. My my book goes from LBJ to the disastrous Trump administrations. And uh, but doesn't really uh, get into the, the current picture with uh, President Biden. Uh, but uh, it is relevant. So uh, how would you like to go? Well, you uh, Olson, Olson and Gregory also write that since 2018, we have been blessed to work with Gus Speth, who did a remarkable job in developing this expert report for our constitutional climate lawsuit, Juliana versus the United States. As you will see, Juliana is no ordinary lawsuit. His report is the most compelling indictment yet written of the federal government's role in the climate crisis. And your book is dedicated to the 21 youth plaintiffs in Juliana versus the United States. As OCT explains, in 2015, 21 youth and organizational plaintiff Earth Guardians filed their constitutional climate lawsuit, Juliana versus the U.S., against the U.S. government. Their complaint asserts that through the government's affirmative actions that cause climate change, it has violated the youngest generation's constitutional right to life, liberty, and property, as well as failed to protect essential public resources. So what is the current state right now of Juliana versus the United States? What is the likelihood that the courts can circumvent the politicians who have been an obstacle to addressing climate change? Well, first, let me just say uh, uh, something positive about this group that I'm working with, uh, our Children's Trust. I'm not really associated as a board of directors member or anything, but they are a powerful and wonderful advocacy for children. And not only have they, uh, you know, uh, represent children in the Juliana litigation that you mentioned and that my, my report is addressed to, uh, but they've also uh, been involved uh, representing children in a number of uh, other legal actions um, here and uh, in, particularly in the U.S. states. Um, the, uh, so I think that um, 
the current, uh, the, 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 every, this case has been pending for about six years now. Uh, that's how long it's been in the courts. And at every stage and at every point, uh, the federal government um, and um, has uh, throughout a, a lot of Obama and, and all of Trump uh, and now with Biden, uh, the federal government has just uh, vigorously resisted having these children go to court and get in court and have their have their day in court and have a trial and, and bring these issues uh, to, to a head, as, as has happened in a number of uh, European countries, as I mentioned. Um, and right now, uh, it's at another stage of the of the litigation uh, where the uh, our children's trust lawyers are, are working very hard to uh, convince the court uh, that they should, that the district court should continue uh, the litigation, uh, despite the opposition of, of the Biden administration. And, and that decision from the district court is expected within a month, maybe. Uh, we don't know for sure, but about that amount of time. And, and what my report, uh, as a passage you read, uh, 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 says my report uh, is aimed at uh, making the case that the federal government has a large share of the responsibility for what has happened and what will happen to today's children and tomorrow's uh, children. Uh, the, the federal government was not simply a passive uh, player uh, in this past 50 year uh, period. This is a very active play of promoting the use of fossil fuels at essentially uh, every turn. And uh, right on up through uh, Obama, say, uh, you know, uh, even though he did some good things on, on the climate issue, a number of them, uh, he was proud as he could be at the end of his administration on how much they had done to promote uh, fracking, uh, fossil fuel exports and other fossil fuel development uh, in the United States. So, so this has been a, a long-term problem, but the federal government has been, despite uh, differences in the various administrations, which I report on, the federal government has been consistently bad about the promotion of fossil fuels, with the result that our, our fossil fuel reliance has uh, actually gone up during this period from Carter through Trump. So is that, do you think that consistency by the federal government in being against the uh, court case of Juliana versus the United States, do you think that's driven not necessarily by a denial of climate change, but the fact that the case, uh, that the suit says that the federal government has been responsible? Is it the responsibility of the federal government that, re, uh, that explains their consistency, whether it's a Republican, whether it's Trump, or whether it's Obama who's in the White House? Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's uh, definitely uh, a, a part of it. And, um, and I think the, uh, uh, the, there's, you know, there's certainly a resistance also to uh, the courts getting uh, into this picture and, and uh, giving some, some guidance uh, and, and a strong prod uh, to the federal government to act and act in a major way. Um, I think it's varied from administration to administration. I mean, there have been administrations like, uh, you know, the Trump administration um, that just uh, didn't want to do anything. And indeed, uh, Trump spent most of his, a lot of his uh, uh, rulemaking energy undoing virtually everything that, uh, that the Obama administration had done that would have helped on, uh, on the climate front. So, um, I think it's varied, but it's certainly what you describe, uh, you know, this uh, shirking or avoidance, the uh, responsibility avoidance, a uh, big part of the picture. So young people are in courts leading the fight against climate change. What does that say to you? What does that reveal to you about the fight for climate change? What does that tell you even about young people today? Because I think that's a, a really interesting aspect of this. This is These aren't senior citizens who are uh, promoting this uh, uh, you know, trial or this lawsuit. These are young people. So what does that reveal to you? What does that say to you about climate change? Well, I think people um, who've been following this issue have uh, been extraordinarily impressed 
over the past uh, uh, five years, say, with the, the birth of a youth climate movement in the country. Uh, and the Juliana lawsuit uh, brought by uh, our Children's Trust uh, was in a way the beginning of this. Um, there were some early, early efforts too, but in a way this, this really brought the uh, young people uh, uh, to the forefront uh, in the climate front, a uh, climate battle. And it has, you know, moved on since then. It's grown. Uh, young people are now carrying the fight. You can see that, uh, of course, in, uh, in Greta Thunberg uh, from, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and what she's done internationally uh, to uh, raise the issue. Uh, and, and also in uh, groups like uh, Sunrise, uh, a very, you know, prominent uh, advocate for climate action, uh, which has mainly uh, come out of, uh, uh, of young people and the youth movement in the country. Also, so this is great. This is great because uh, Lord knows some of us are getting up there and uh, are uh, on our last, uh, last efforts. So Olson and Gregory also write, the nation's dependence on fossil fuels could not have occurred but for the defendant's unconstitutional conduct. How can fossil fuels be considered unconstitutional, Gus? Well, you know, not uh, the due process clause protecting us, uh, which you quoted, uh, you know, doesn't just doesn't uh, save us from everything, right? It doesn't prevent poverty in our society and a host of other problems. So, uh, should it prevent uh, uh, disastrous uh, climate change? Well, I th the the theory, legal theory. Uh, is that um, if the federal government is uh, responsible, uh, is, is part of the endangerment uh, of young people and future generations, uh, and is responsible for causing the problem, and had the knowledge that it needed to do something else uh, and avoid the, the problem, uh, then that is a violation of uh, due process and um, what's called substantive due process as opposed to procedural uh, due process, which, and, uh, and that is indeed what has happened here. The federal government uh, knew about this problem in detail from the, from the Carter administration uh, forward. Uh, it knew alternatives that it could pursue, and indeed Carter started pursuing those alternatives in his administration principally renewables and, and energy efficiency gains. Uh, and thirdly, the federal government throughout that time, since CARTA and forward, uh, have uh, ignored uh, those requirements, really, those findings, uh, and have moved forward to promote fossil fuels. So the result, uh, you know, is what we have today. Uh, huge buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And... Uh, and, and clearly visible uh, disasters uh, uh, right here at home, uh, uh, all coming from uh, global warming and climate disruption. Gus, you're a legal scholar. You were pointing out to, that in courts elsewhere than other than the United States, there has been success in changing a policy towards climate change. How unprecedented is this kind of lawsuit in the United States by citizens who are trying to sue the government in order to make a policy change? Well, citizens suing our government in order to make uh, policy changes is, uh, is a very uh, well-worn uh, path. Uh, indeed, that was where I started uh, in the 70s, uh, litigating uh, policy change uh, in the federal courts uh, on environmental issues, uh, and um, but uh, but this uh, in bringing the Constitution into the picture uh, and asserting a constitutional right uh, uh, for a, a healthy and, and livable uh, climate uh, in the fa uh, against uh, uh, action by the federal government to produce exactly the opposite, uh, bringing the Constitution in in that context uh, is new. And, uh, and I think it would be uh, 
uh, a marvelous, uh, wonderful uh, breakthrough in our country uh, to have the courts uh, declare uh, that this constitutional right uh, exists and, uh, and to bring the force of our, uh, of our mother law uh, into this picture of, 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 of getting our government straightened out and helping to save the planet. This, what, could be more, what could be more important? This new use of the Constitution in this situation, how much do you think that has become an obstacle to Juliana versus the United States moving forward? Well, I, I, I honestly, uh, um, you know, I think it certainly the federal government has uh, not warmed up to the idea that there is a constitutional right here. Most of the litigation uh, has been about preliminary issues to uh, before you reach this this ultimate question. Uh, but uh, the, the now with the Biden administration there uh, and you know, having taken the position that it acknowledges the um, uh, the, the climate problem uh, and uh, proclaimed uh, far-reaching, really, uh, climate goals that the Biden administration uh, uh, wants to pursue and indeed uh, launch some uh, efforts uh, in these directions, uh, not enough, but, in, but some efforts, you would think that in the litigation uh, they would agree uh, to uh, a set of facts. Uh, I don't want to get too legalistic here, but if you if you agree on the facts, um, then you can go to the legal questions uh, that the facts present. And in this case, uh, that would be, uh, among other things, the constitutional claim. So I think the Biden administration ought to agree with the plaintiffs uh, if they're serious about what they're saying on the uh, on climate, they should be in agreement with the plaintiffs on the seriousness of the issue, you know, the need to do something about it, and a lot of the details uh, uh, about climate change and what's causing it and what we need to do to solve the problem. And if you have those basic agreements, uh, which are, you know, which every administration has, has had information about, as I report uh, in the book, um, you know, then uh, then let's get to the to the ultimate issue. Let let's let's face this question of whether the country needs and 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 actually requires a uh, a constitutional protection. Um, because Lord knows, otherwise, you know, right now I've been working this issue since uh, the you know the 80s, uh, and and. You know we're we're going down the tubes pretty fast. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to look at the hurricanes and the fires and the floods and uh, and the loss of uh, biological resources and the uh, uh, you know coastal uh, inundations, uh, the movement of people. Uh, I'm up here in Vermont, and we're waiting on the folks to come from the seacoast uh, because the seacoast is going fast. And you know th these are. These are serious, uh, serious problems, uh, and and uh, we certainly, uh, I think, a, a constitutional decision would shake things up in this country and move things along in a positive way, very nicely. In your expert report that you submitted for Juliana versus the United States, you write by the end of the Carter administra administration in January 1981, almost four decades ago, it was already clear that defendants knew the basic science of climate change and knew that the continued burning of high levels of fossil fuels would lead to climate danger. And defendants knew of pathways recommended by experts within government and others to transition away from fossil fuels, including through conservation, efficiency, and solar and other renewables. This means there cannot be a claim that nobody in the government knew of the dangers of burning fossil fuels and its impact on the environment. How well was this known by elected government representatives? Was this known throughout elected leadership or just within a certain few key agencies? Well, it was, I think, by the time the Carter administration uh, was up and running, uh, it was widely appreciated within the administration. Uh, the, uh, the president's science advisor at that time was a very distinguished American scientist named Frank Press. And early in the Carter administration, he, 
he presented a memorandum to the president and uh, at that time to the president's energy advisor, James Schlesinger, who became the first secretary of energy a short while later. Uh, and the press uh, uh, um, emailed to, to, not email, pardon that, uh, memo uh, to the president was uh, very, very clear about the nature of the problem, the nature of the causes, the need to begin to take it seriously. He said there was no, it was an urgent issue at this point, but it was, there was a need to get started. And he commissioned a report from the National Academy of Sciences uh, a short while later in, in 1979 uh, that uh, basically said um, that, that, you know, that found that this was that no reason to doubt the seriousness of this problem and no reason to doubt that uh, it was going to, to get worse. And, and it was caused by human action. Um, this was the National Academy of Sciences in, you know, 1979. And said that there's little comfort here uh, for for policymakers because uh, if we wait until we are really getting powerful signals about the nature of climate change, we will probably have waited too late. Well, that's where we are now. We're too late to head off a lot. But this was known way back then in the Carter administration. Uh, there were a flurry of reports done uh, by uh, our agency, the Council on Environmental Quality and uh, by the Department of Energy, which had uh, its own climate program, and uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and others. And that pattern has persisted on every, in every administration. Every administration has been presented with compelling evidence from its own agencies and its agencies' contractors and, and, and from other outside sources. Every administration has been presented with compelling warnings about what was coming, what was causing it, and what to do about it, and largely ignored. So the government knew, but did the public, was the media telling, has the media been telling the public since 40 years ago that the government knows climate change is a real danger? Because I'm trying to figure out if the public knew and if the media was telling them. Right. Well, this is a this is a a, a big issue uh, and a very interesting one. Uh, in one sense, the public was alerted, uh, fully alerted. Uh, I can attest firsthand to the uh, to the media coverage uh, in the Carta years, and uh, this was these were not just internal debates. Uh, they were in the New York Times, for example, uh, and other newspapers, well covered. Uh, the, the, you know, we at CEQ created a stir by forcing this issue into the policy process. And that debate that we had within the administration and our CEQ debate with the Department of Energy, for example, uh, was in the, uh, in, the, in, in the newspapers. And I think throughout this period, there have been a steady stream of, of good coverage, uh, particularly from science writers and others, in the media, you you know you may recover that the, the the boiling earth was on the cover of Time magazine back when when it had uh, the, it was the planet of the year instead of the person of the year back uh, back then, and there has been a lot of coverage of this climate issue, and anybody who wanted uh, to know uh, could um, could have found out. That said, you do have to ask. Uh, you know, whether it was well covered, given the seriousness of the problem. There were there, there have been decades in which extreme weather events uh, were reported, for example, by the telly, uh, you know, news, and uh, no mention was made of the fact that it could have been caused and was likely enhanced and, or whatever the right phrasing might have been for that event, uh, you know, by climate change. Uh, the, the, the lots of opportunities to, to bring home the reality of climate change uh, were, have been missed uh, by the media. And a lot of reporting that could have been done uh, linking uh, climate change to uh, civil, civil uh, strifes around the world and, and, and conflicts around the world and water shortages 
and, and droughts and other things, a lot could have been done to bring this to the public that wasn't done. And uh, so I used to just, you know, watch the evening news pulling my hair out. You know, why aren't they talking about climate change? Uh, and I'm sure many others uh, uh, have been as well. So you can see the difference now because, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the hurricane in, in the Louisiana now moving up the East Coast and creating uh, flooding as far north as New York. Uh, they, um, you know, the media has uh, easily mentioned that this is this is a, a, a an, an event which was enhanced and and in, enlarged uh, uh, by uh, by climate change, and that the warming temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico were part of that problem, and similarly uh, the fires out west and the drought, the extraordinary long-term drought in the in the west. Um, and how that is fueling these fires. Um, so it's, um, it, there's no question that the media dropped the ball, in my judgment, although the attentive reader certainly could have found material. So do you think it would be unfair then to blame this lack of action on climate change on the voters who voted these the elected leadership into power because of this lack of information that was being given by the media? Is the public complicit in climate change? Well, I'd like to break that down a little bit. Uh, are the politicians complicit? Absolutely. I mean, they are people who uh, have access to all the information I report in my book. I report a lot about the presentations to the Congress, uh, the famous Jim, Jim Hansen, uh, uh, NASA scientist, uh, uh, three times uh, presented to the Congress in the 1980s, uh, alarming testimony, uh, and, um, and, and much, much, much more. So the Congress was was really fully uh, apprised of the whole the whole thing, and um, and and did a few things too along the way to uh, to address the issue. Uh, I want to come back to what I think the real test is about for for leadership, whether it's Congress or the president, if if I can in a moment. But uh, so yes, there was uh, uh, there was a neglect on the part of our political leaders who. Who were informed and uh, uh, and 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 knew better, and if they didn't know better, they should have. Uh, but the um, and I, I think uh, and I, you know at the risk of uh, sounding partisan, which uh, I almost certainly am, really. Um, but the, uh, the 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 opposition's most extreme opposition within every administration. Uh, across the board has come from Republican administrations, a and they, they uh, to this day are uh, anti-action uh, on climate change, uh, whereas the Democrats are to this day have been pushing for uh, action, and that partisan divide, which uh, I, as I recount in the book, was uh, you know grew rather dramatically in the in the uh, Clinton-Gore administration, it really began to take off at that point. Uh, this partisan divide has uh, has been the a uh, you know a huge factor in 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 the lack of progress on the climate issue. So you were talking you were talking about who holds the real power, the Congress or the president? How what is the what is your uh, thinking on that? Well, I think when it comes to what has to happen on the climate change, the, the real power, uh, it's obviously shared, and it's hard to you know put a percentage on, on, on responsibility and, and blame. Uh, but um, you know the bottom line is that this, this problem requires national legislation. Uh, we can you know do a lot with uh, uh, earlier legislation like the Clean Air Act. And other things, but uh, in the end, we we need national legislation. And indeed, that's where the action is right now. I mean, there's a lot of important climate initiative in the um, the three point trillion, three point five trillion infrastructure legislation that's been introduced. 
uh, into the Congress. And uh, I'm really proud of our uh, senator here from Vermont, our Senator Sanders, who's uh, now the chairman of the budget, budget committee and has, uh, has done the most to shepherd that legislation into being. So, uh, you know, but it really does, uh, whether it's uh, big spending that's needed or uh, regulatory requirements or uh, cap and trade or uh, for the, you know, climate changing pollutants, um, whatever the, whatever the approach you want to take, it's going to have to come uh, at, at, the, at scale uh, from our Congress, from the legislators. You write in your uh, expert evidence in Juliana versus the United States, significantly President Nixon was advised in September of 1969 by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, then Nixon's counselor for urban affairs, that if climate change was not addressed, quote, it is now pretty clearly agreed that the CO2 content will rise 25% by 2000. This is Moynihan talking. This could increase the average uh, temperature near the Earth's surface by degrees Fahrenheit. This, in turn, could raise the level of the sea by 10 feet. Goodbye, New York. Goodbye, Washington, for that matter. So Nixon knew. He also created the EPA and signed the Clean Air Act into law. How effective were the creation of that agency and making that act law in addressing climate change? Can the government, could the government, argue that they did try to fight the effects of fossil fuel upon discovering of its effects during the Nixon administration? No, you, you can't argue that. <laughs> but it is true uh, that the Clean Air Act and indeed the Clean Water Act were passed uh, during the Nixon administration. And it is also true that the principal legislative authority, or certainly a principal legislative authority, that we still have to this day, um, you know, all these years from 1970, uh, the principal legislative authority is still out there is the Clean Air Act. And a, uh, you know, in the lo- legal circles, a, a rather famous decision, um, uh, Massachusetts against uh, EPA, where the Supreme Court uh basically required the EPA to begin to take the climate issue uh, into account under the Clean Air Act. And uh, that was a big decision, and it's still a a leading authority uh, for action. Uh, Of course, it doesn't get to what action, and it's been debated since, but it it is true that uh, Nixon-era legislation uh, is still important in uh, in this fight. You also quote President Nixon in his 1970 State of the Union address saying, restoring nature to its natural state is a cause beyond party and beyond factions. It has become a common cause of all of the people of this country. It is a cause of particular concern to young Americans because they more than will than we will reap the grim consequences of our failure to act on programs which are needed now if we are to prevent disaster later. Clean air, clean water, open spaces, these should once again be the birthright of every American. If we act now, they can be. You were mentioning how during the Clinton administration, this issue became partisan. partisan. Was environmentalism at the time of Nixon, at the time of Carter, at the time of even Reagan and the first Bush. Bipartisan, was Nixon correct that at the time, concerns for nature had become a common cause for all people, no matter their political affiliation? Well, I, I, just be, to be clear about one thing, I certainly am not suggesting that uh, Clinton-Gore uh, administration uh, created the, the partisan uh, divide. What, what happened was that they began to uh, try to elevate the issue in public a- attention, and uh, and 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 the Republican Party uh, began to shift at that uh, around that time dramatically against any kind of climate action to the point that now we are, you know, in a, an ocean of this climate denial uh, on the Republican side. Uh, so that was, you know, that's kind of uh, uh, the story. Uh, of how that uh, happened. Uh, I think the answer, partly answer to your question is, uh, you know, uh, you know, your listeners should think, can you imagine uh, minority leader Kevin McCarthy uh, embracing uh, that kind of uh, Nixon-esque approach uh, to environment uh, today? 
uh, you just can't. A and it gives you a sense of how, how far uh, the Republican Party uh, has drifted towards a, an anti-environment, anti-climate action a stance. When we started with environment, uh, you know, in the late 60s and early 70s, you know, one champion we had uh, was uh, Senator Ed Muskie from Maine. And um, his uh, colleague uh, was Senator John Sherman Cooper, a Republican uh, from Kentucky. Uh, and uh, later, Howard Baker, a Republican from Tennessee, became one of the most vigorous uh, supporters of environmental progress in, in the Congress. And, uh, and, and in that era, uh, we had a lot of Republican support, and, and there wasn't this fierce, debilitating uh, partisan divide uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we have uh, had today. And the divide is, you know, you might say, well, that's a plague on both their houses for being partisan, but that really is quite misleading. Uh, what has really happened uh, is, that, uh, is that the Republican Party has bought in uh, in a way that they were not bought in in the 70s, for example, uh, in, into an ideology uh, which um, uh, is, uh, is, is anti uh, government anti-regulation, and, and creates this, uh, this this mythology that uh, protecting environment protecting the environment is going to destroy the economy, it's going to put people out of jobs, it's going to raise prices, uh, and on and on, um, and, and really opposes uh, public interest measures of that type across a broad front, not just environment, but all kinds of issues as we, you know, see in the news every day. You cite a speech in 1980 by President Carter where he talks about concerns over climate change. He says these kinds of concerns affect you and me, and on some of them we've hardly begun to work on corrective action that might be proposed, much less accepted and implemented. This last decade, however, has demonstrated that we can buck the trends. But you also point out that all that said and done, President Carter's address that day also said it's important to pursue a broad range of alternative energy sources including synthetic fuels. And he mentioned his highly controversial proposal for an energy mobilization board to eliminate unnecessary delays in approving energy projects. You add the legislation to create the mobilization board never passed. Yet, in some respects, Carter's proposals were merely ahead of their time. Subsequently, oil and gas markets are today awash with unconventional oil and gas thanks in large part to federal support and facilitation. Did concessions to the fossil fuel industry and the government's environmental policy make legislation meant to address climate change vulnerable to exploitation? Yes. I mean, I think the fossil fuel industry has been enormously powerful politically, uh, in, historically, and, and to this day. Uh, and, um, and I think the... Uh, you know, they, they have sought to justify it in a lot of ways, uh, some of which are, have gotten them sued, Exxon in particular, uh, lately. And, and there are a flurry of lawsuits against the fossil fuel industry to hold them accountable, uh, brought by cities and states in the U.S., and, uh, and to make them pay for some of the damages that the cities are encountering. Um, that's all uh, going on. There's no doubt that the fossil lobby has been uh, hugely influential and hugely powerful in, in slowing up uh, action uh, on the uh, climate, climate uh, front. The, um, so I think there was another issue in your question that I'm not remembering exactly. Uh, That's okay. Uh, but I just want to uh, get to this other point about the Charney report because I found this really oh, fascinating. Yeah, but let, let me, um, Carter, I want to talk for just a second. Okay. It is about Carter. Go ahead. Um, Carter had a, a, you know, a, a hell of a challenge, right? He, he came in and, uh, and, and we had just, uh, were experiencing these uh, oil embargoes and uh, oil price uh, shocks and OPEC uh, restrictions. Uh, and things, and and we were had had become in the period of a few years enormously uh, dependent on imported oil for the first time in U.S. Uh, uh, history, 
and, and, and Carter had to get out of that. So, uh, you know, he decided that, um, that non-oil fossil fuels were part of the strategy of getting out. So you do have this, and, and that, that led to his idea uh, for promoting synthetic fuels, uh, tar sands and oil shields and, 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 and uh, oil made from, you know, harder fossil fuels. But, um, but Carter also did something for the first time uh, among, among all the presidents, uh, certainly the first, and, 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 and one of the most prominent uh, to this day. Uh, while he was trying to get us out of this, uh, this uh, uh, headlock we were in from OPEC, uh, he was also made it repeatedly clear over and over again that the country's long-term energy future uh, lied in moving to renewable energy uh, off of fossil fuels and depended on removing to very high uh, energy efficiency rather than the energy guzzling uh, habits uh, of that day and including today. Uh, but, um, and, and so Carter promoted renewable energy and efficiency uh, alongside his promotion of, uh, of fossil fuels. And uh, it really started the path, uh, or put us on a path that if we had followed in the next 40 years, uh, would lead to a radically different situation today. Uh, and um, so I give Carter tremendous credit, uh, and perhaps a little self-servingly since I was, I was there, but I think it's objective uh, that he started us on the right path towards a solution. And, um, and of course, that was quickly uh, erased uh, to the fullest extent possible by President Reagan. Um, so, on to Charney. Yeah. Well, no, I want to ask you this real quick. So you were talking about uh, the Middle Eastern oil crisis that was happening at the time. Could Carter, let's say uh, Jimmy Carter had a second term in office, could Carter addressing climate change, in your opinion, also have solved any issues the United States had with dependence on Middle Eastern oil? Could have it addressed the national security issue when it came to the Middle East, as well as the environmental and national security issue when it comes to the climate change and the United States? Well, I think I think the answer is yes. Uh, uh, Carter um, had already announced uh, a national goal of getting to twenty percent renewable energy um, by twenty twenty, and um, uh, and that would uh, you know uh, and and that could have been built upon. Uh, it could have been. Uh, uh, you know, activated uh, through legislation and funding and other things and, and pursued in the ensuing years. Um, and um, no, I'm sorry, by the year 2000, not 2020. So it was a, an ambitious uh, goal. Um, and we could be well beyond that uh, uh, today. And, uh, and he also, uh, you know, was criticized by uh, interesting story I'll tell in a moment, but he was criticized for promoting uh, energy efficiency. Um, and he went on television to talk about the need to turn down thermostats and save energy and become energy sippers. Uh, and he didn't wear his uh, jacket. He wore a sweater to indicate he was, you know, staying warm that way uh, rather than, uh, than, than turning the thermostat. And... Um, and he was uh, he was attacked, uh, you know, strongly from the clothes making industry of the country, uh, and, and anyhow, they uh, there was uh, um, there were um, uh, very uh, impressive measures uh, from the Carter administration. So if he had been reelected, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, that he knew what had to be done. Uh, that we had to pursue the, this alternative path, uh, and, uh, you know, with an ever deepening uh, seriousness and, and, and commitment. Um, and uh, I think it was a great loss that he, he wasn't uh, reelected, and uh, for this reason and, and others. But he, uh, this, um, 
you know, the, the path forward was very clear to him. And in, in the, uh, uh, in, in my book, I, I quote a, a lot of the things that, uh, that he said and report on the things that he did to promote renewables and, and efficiency. And, 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 uh, and so if we continued with that effort, symbolized by the putting of uh, solar collectors on the White House roof, um, if we continued with that effort forward until today, well, we, we really would uh, have the U.S. at least in a truly uh, excellent position uh, on the climate issue rather than, uh, you know, the misery that we are creating for the world uh, right now. And you write that the National Academy of Sciences convened a panel under the chair of MIT Professor Julie Charney, and the panel met in July of 1979. You quote the Charney report stating, a wait-and-see policy may mean waiting until it is too late. Then you mention how the Department of Energy released a report in July of 1980 on its summary of the carbon dioxide effects research and assessment program, which also reflected the scientific consensus. It is the sense of the scientific community that carbon dioxide from the un restrained combustion of fossil fuels is potentially the most important environmental issue facing mankind. Has the problem with addressing the burning of fossil fuel been that government agencies were declaring climate change as an emergency, but elected representatives were refusing to see it as one? Is there a disconnect between government findings and government policy? And if so, why? I mean, what's the point of government agencies doing research and making findings if politicians do not act on those conclusions? Well, that's a darn good question uh, because they clearly haven't. Uh, the uh, there's certainly a disconnect between uh, the scientific community uh, and uh, and and government action. Uh, indeed, it would be hard to imagine a wider uh, gap uh, between what the scientific community has uh, has repeatedly uh, said uh, and with a, with a louder and louder voice. I might add. Uh, from, you know, for over the past 40 years uh, and, and between what they have said and what the, um, and what the federal government has actually done. And uh, so it brings us in a way uh, to President Biden. And it's an interesting, you know, it's a very interesting and important what's going on right now. Uh, it would be hard to imagine anything more important right at this moment uh, than for Biden to succeed on what he's proposing to do uh, on the uh, uh, on the climate issue. Uh, I mean, he uh, the policies that they put in place are are not uh, as good as they they should be, but um, they are. You know, the goals that he's set are. Um, extraordinary really uh and 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 uh, represent a very good start you know to reduce emissions by 50 percent uh by 2030 now, that's not far away 50 percent reduction in emissions from fossil fuels and other greenhouse gases uh to move to an energy uh, electricity system a power system with zero net zero emissions um well uh, yeah, 100% clean power by 2035. Again, not that far away. Uh, and net zero total emissions by 2050, which is uh, an international goal uh, as well. So these are these are impressive. And uh, and and what has happened? What this you know represents is that you have an administration which is recognizing that the day of fossil fuels uh, is over and that we no longer can sustain fossil fuel use at current levels or increasing it or any of the above. It got fossil fuel use has got to go sharply down. And this is a breakthrough in, in, you know, in federal policy. Now, and, and, and for Biden to succeed would you know, in a, in a way, validate those goals. It would confirm that we're on the path to such goals. And so what we have to hope for is, and, and work assiduously for, is that Biden uh, gets the, 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 what he's trying to do done successfully. And it's not clear right now that that's going to happen. Um, 
you know, and, and, and so here we are uh, at a very critical moment uh, in the history of the climate issue. An administration which has finally embraced the need to get out of the fossil fuel business and, and do it pretty quickly, really. Um, and, um, and, 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 and the huge pushback that we're seeing it uh, at, at all, uh, you know, various uh, places and, and levels of, of, of action. I mean, a lot of the pushback is coming from uh, state levels, uh, uh, you know, cities, uh, the states trying to block cities from uh, stopping the use of uh, natural gas in buildings. Uh, states are doing some terrible things out there right now that are contrary to what the president is, is aiming for. And of course, uh, Congress is, is in the throes of deciding what to do with all of these, all the legislation which goes under the name of, of, of infrastructure, uh, and a lot of which deals with the climate issue. And then in the regulatory agencies uh, like EPA, uh, you know, they have a huge burden of undoing the terrible things that uh, Trump did and, uh, and then getting some, some new tough regulations uh, in place across this whole front of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions and, and fossil fuel use. So we're at an absolutely critical moment uh, in the history of, of this issue right now. And, and what I hope that this book will do is uh, undermine any possible thought that we haven't known about this for a long time and any possible thought that uh, we don't know what to do about this uh, problem and uh, hopefully contribute to demolishing the idea that, uh, you know, we have to, um, we have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to help the economy, we have to ruin the planet, which is, uh, you know, a lot of what uh, people are, are think, you know, some party <clears throat> in particular is, uh, is, is saying today. So, Gus, I just looked up at the clock. <laughs> Time flew by. Uh, so I've got one last question for you. We've been speaking with James Gustav Speth, author of They Knew, the U.S. federal government's 50-year role in causing the climate crisis. And we just skimmed the surface of the intense content in Gus's book. You should definitely check it out. One last question for you, Gus. And as we do with all of our guests, I promise, our final question is what we call the question from hell, the question we hate to ask. You might hate to answer. Our audience is going to hate your response. Can't we blame this all on the fossil fuel industry? Can't we, instead of uh, holding the government responsible, can't we just say, you know, they, it, it wasn't the government's fault as much as it was the intense influence of the fossil fuel industry? Well, I think uh, certainly the fossil fuel industry is culpable and is culpable uh, in part for its, uh, its uh, manipulation of, uh, of federal policy. And uh, it, its use of the federal facility, so to speak, uh, you know, a huge portion of fossil fuel use uh, comes from, uh, in the country, comes from federal resources, uh, which have been released and leased and, and otherwise uh, made available to the fossil fuel industry. Um, so yeah, those, those folks are, are deeply uh, responsible and accountable. But, you know, we have, um, uh, we have a government uh, which is, um, uh, you know, its, its purpose is, is to uh, help us, to help citizens find a better life and to, um, and, and to save us from problems like uh, climate destruction. Uh, and, and, you know, what are they good for if they can't do that, for goodness sake? So uh, a plague on both their houses so far, and uh, we'll see what happens. Gus. Thank you so much for being on our show. I wish we could talk for two hours, but unfortunately, we just don't have that much time. I really appreciate you being on the show with us today. Take care and enjoy your weekend. My pleasure. You've been listening to a This Is Hell interview. For more interview hell and to support the show, visit thisishell.com.